be fell. It's time to be called to order this February 24th meeting Cleveland County Board of Education. And I'd like to ask Ms. Miller if she would like to introduce her student to be able to do it. Tonight we have students from Springmore Elementary who are going to help us with the pledge. We have Doobie Mofta, Marvin Garcia, Carson Lookamill, Lucy Merritt, and Caleb Watkins.
Asheville and major in health and wellness and later go into physical therapy. and I represent Cleveland Early College High School. My parents are Angie Standish and Rob Standish. I'm included, I'm involved in several uh, community activities, including mission trips that go across the country. I, uh, the church is a food closet and backpack ministry to allow food to be given to the homeless and children in need. And I have a job at Ingalls on Patterson Springs. I plan to attend college at Leeds McRae, uh, and then uh, transfer to NC State for pre-vet and then full veterinary medicine. And my career goal is to be a vet and own my own business. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Arteja Shanice Brooks. I am a senior at Kings Mountain High School. My parents are April Willis Weber and William Scott Brooks. I am involved in several activities and community activities. I'm involved in theater arts. I'm currently working on the musical production here spring. I volunteer at KM Elite Sports and Enrichment Program. I taught an art and design class. I help with concessions and I help them with banners for their sponsoring their club. I also help build theater sets and I did it over the summer I did teacher assisting with helping teachers get their classrooms together. I plan to attend college at North Carolina State University and study polymer color chemistry. My career goal is to own my own fashion and cosmetics business. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Bishop Billy Castro. Uh, I'm a senior at Christ High School. My parents are Miriam and Felicia Billy Castro. Uh, some of the activities that I'm involved in at school are I am currently the Baby Club President um, uh, in the Spanish Club. I am founder of the Chess Club, and I also am currently employed at Chick fil A. Uh, I'm not sure which college I am going to attend yet and uh, apply to study medicine, hopefully. And my ultimate career goals is to hopefully become a uh, family physician. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Carrie Burke. I'm a senior at Crest High School. My parents are Susan Ruby and Dennis Burke. I'm involved in um, the Beta Club, Spanish Club, and Science Columbia. Um, we're also starting up the chess club. I'm going to be joining that. Um, I work on the weekends at KFC, and I plan to attend UNC at Greensboro and study web development. 
and I also like to continue my Spanish education and possibly minor in Spanish. Good evening, Mr. Jr. My name is Austin Tony. I'm a senior at Kings Mountain High School. My parents are Hope and Barry Tony. I'm involved in several activities, including the Bar Club. For the past six years, I've uh, worked with the Special Olympics recently. I have also given many swim clubs during my high school career. I'm a year-round competitive swimmer, and most recently I became the state champion in the 100 yard breaststroke. I plan on attending college at Gardner University, where I plan on majoring in exercise science and then continuing on to the physician assistant program. Chairman. My name is Tayon Lewis. My parents are Betsy and Charles Lewis. I'm involved in Portrait Club and the creator and president of it. I'm also a member of the Spanish Club and I'm an uh, assistant techie at my church. <laughs> we also volunteer at the nursing home on Sundays. I plan to attend USC Charlotte. Uh, I want to major in criminal justice, minor in psychology and Spanish, and after that I want to become a cop. sets of minutes. The first one is the minutes of the February uh, 5th uh, call session uh, for accreditation. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? I'll make a motion we approve the February 5th call session. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. I got a little ahead of the game so we will revert to come back in a minute to uh, the other uh, sessions. We do have a period of public participation, as you all know, which we allocate 15 minutes to separate three-minute uh, <clears throat> uh, comment sessions from uh, the audience. And tonight we have three who wish to speak. The first is Sandy Mosteller. Would she please come forward? Thank you. 
I received a letter from you dated February 18th denying my request to be put on the agenda for tonight's meeting. You indicated that the school system does not have the resources to answer my questions because doing so would pull the staff away from the students. Secondly, you stated that the board was not legally obligated to answer any questions other than requests for public records. And lastly, you said that the school system was not in any way attempting to keep its fiscal operations secret because records are available in the public Financial audits are available online and the board meetings are open to the public. I have a response ready for your three reasons, but I think the words of two elementary school teachers express the point better than I can. Yesterday, my wife asked two teacher friends why they didn't attend board meetings. One of the teachers said that it was very apparent to the, 
very apparent that the administration and board did not want to hear from them, so they just didn't go to the trouble of attending. The second teacher...
rest of what's going on. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions for the board? The town hall meetings, are they held in the evenings or in the construction plan? In the evenings. Uh, right now, the only one that I've uh, nailed down is, is one for um, a small homeschool group, but I wanted to see if I could get with the principals to see maybe I could get a lunchroom or an auditorium um, in the evening when there's not oh a basketball game or a baseball game or you know any, any kind of thing like that going on. Just uh, an opportunity, and I'm always available. Um, I've already set up some meetings in uh, workplaces where the HR manager or, or the plant manager wants me to speak to their employees that have high school age children. So hopefully I'll be able to cover all that if they're not able to come to an evening time. standard and, and use that as a cumulative 
the score. So, you know, I give you the example if a student, you know, has three passages made as 15 questions, they score 11 out of 15. That gets them above the 70 percent, and that allows them to uh, complete that um, that standard. So that really does provide some uh, flexibility for our students, and we see a lot more students being successful with that rate. Having uh, scoring those passages individually is very difficult. So if a student does, you know, does not as well on one of those passages, but does well on some others, they're able to add those together. So that's really that's really when I uh, met the principals and our curriculum folks at the elementary level, they were uh, very excited about that. <clears throat> um, one of the things also that you heard about was uh, frustration, I believe. Um, I know Ben Harris was in the group at Bullen Springs, and, and I know some of you other, uh, other board members were. I'm not sure who was in that group, but uh, what we heard from teachers were they were frustrated because they couldn't go back and, and teach from these passages. You know, they, uh, any good teacher understands that form of assessment. You give that form of assessment, you give back and teach from it. Uh, but now we have the flexibility to do that. Um, this was my third grade classroom. I could give you a portfolio, you could take it, I'll take it up, I'll assess it, and then I could give it back to you. We can teach from it, we can learn from Mr. Harris's mistakes, we can understand why Ms. Miller chose B and got all the answers right. So that's a real big thing for our teachers to be able to use that, which enabled the time that we're spending on doing these portfolio assessments. Now we're able to really impact and improve instruction. So our, our teachers and our administrators are really we're excited about that. Uh, also, the response is maybe that shared with parents, and that's been a change. And now the parents can come in and see where my child's at, what are they missing, what do I need to help them with at home. Um, I know I've got uh, uh, folks that I've communicated with that, that were frustrated at the beginning about, I don't even know what my child is missing, I can't see them, I can't do those things, but now they have that opportunity. Uh, number four, good cause exemptions. Uh, included now are uh, or extend one and extend two. Uh, in the past, those were not included. Um, so if you're familiar with that uh, exceptional children's uh, terminology, we can include those two with good cause exemptions. So that's made a, a good thing. Um, and then the fifth thing is we, the main point of our waiver that night was to, um, to look at uh, an alternate assessment to be able to use to meet the requirements of read to achieve. If you remember our district asked to be able to use reading to read um, that was approved, and um, but we needed a, a few other things need to happen for that for, for final approval. Um, while that was approved, and I think um, Dr. Bulls, you may have the exact number, but I believe there were 12 or 13 um, districts that submitted some things, and all of those things were approved. Um, we have to send in a statement that um, we verify that, um, and I'll read it to you: a statement verifying the requested alternative assessment is a validly reliable standardized assessment of reading comprehension and demonstrates that the student is reading at or above the third grade level as required by the Read to Achieve Law. Um, and the documentation that I provided you, if you look at those attachments two, three, and four, really gives us, uh, in what we believe, ample documentation that Reading 3D does that. Um, if you, uh, the second page that I gave you just is the waiver options, and I just cut and pasted that from my original letter, so you <clears throat> um, and what we ask, um, if board members, and I know I've given you this information, a lot of information, uh, but what we're going to ask is we'll come back to you on March 10th, uh, giving you a draft of a letter that we would ask for your approval so that we could officially use Reading 3D as an alternate assessment in Cleveland County Schools. Um, and the students scoring at level P would be uh, considered to demonstrate mastery. So, um, with that information, I'll be glad to answer any questions that I can tonight, um, or um, we will come back to you on March 10th. It will be time to look over that documentation, that letter, um, and, and I'll be glad, and honor or not, people will be glad to answer any questions you have. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Did I understand you to say that other districts are also using the Read 3D as well as Cleveland County Schools? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Um, basically, in the, the the uh, most that was passed is anything that was passed, any district could use. Um, and and there are other districts that need to be able to do that. Do we, um, do we, do you have a way to get a reply from Dr. Atkinson before, I mean, I know they're already using read, uh, reading 3D, but they'll just Yes, ma'am, they'll continue on. When that end of the year assessment, we're going to give that end of the year assessment regardless. Uh, we have to use reading 3D anyway. Mm -hmm. um, this will be uh, an avenue if students don't have a portfolio done, if they don't pass the EOD, this will be another safety net there that if they are proficient, if they're a level P, they will not have to go somewhere else. Um, 
Ms. Guthrie, Carolyn Guthrie, the DBI consultant, basically her information to me was, your board passes this, the board chairman signs it, it's gonna be approved, and you've got that option. They're gonna approve these options, but we have to have the board approval. Would you use the written 3D as a sole assessment? It wouldn't be the sole assessment, Mr. Harris. It would be an assessment that after, if a student didn't do the portfolio, had to leave the portfolio, didn't, didn't make the necessary score on the beginning of the grade, didn't make the necessary score on the end of the grade, but on their TRC or reading 3D, if they scored a level P on that, which would be grade level proficient, then we would use that as a standard for them not to have to go to certain people. In order to improve that level P. That's correct. And it may just be a typo, but I don't know if you know, I just want to be clear that the North Carolina STEM 1 and STEM 2, it says that they included not. So okay, they are included, yes. Okay. They are, uh, they're a good cause exemption. That means they're exempt from uh, having to pass that. Okay. It originally was just extend one, but now it's extend one and extend two. Um, and if you remember, um, part of the exceptional children clarification, um, they've asked for, a, for some additional flexibility with, with these students, but at this point it's just extend one and extend two. Comment uh, with respect to uh, the uh, state board meeting uh, on February 30th, or respectively, there was a lot of discussion. I think the regional chief consumed a lot of the time. Uh, I was somewhat uh, uh, informed, uh, somewhat of uh, the numerous uh, assessments that were uh, written. I sort of read uh, most of the waiver that has been submitted, 13 and 15 <coughs> noted. And it uh, seemed like the majority of them had, of course, a lot of them had the 3D, but there were a lot of assessments that I didn't know existed, quite honestly, so it was very informative and educational for me. Uh, the other concerns that were expressed by some of the board members, you know, were the, uh, the uh, proliferation in their minds of testing that was ongoing. Uh, some of the uh, board members, and particularly the uh, principal of uh, the uh, state superintendent or uh, national superintendent of the year, Express a lot of concerns and frustration, particularly among the third grade teachers in terms of the workload and the distraction from their instructional time. So I think the, um, the board was very sensitive to that. Uh, I'm also aware that, um, uh, that uh, the uh, oversight committee and the legislators were not too kind to so many of the changes and recommendations, but they also received very well the recommendations from the advisory committee uh, that sort of preluded. Uh, the uh, approval of many of those waivers. So uh, they, 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 that was well received. We're very sensitive to our third grade teachers. We, we've met with those teachers. We've listened to those teachers. We've met with our administrators. Uh, one of the things we did not, not want to do is add even more testing. Um, and, and reading 3D is something that we're doing in, in classrooms. We're, we're doing that. Um, and so uh, we had some options to add uh, additional benchmarks and additional testing. We felt like you know we were in, you know continuing to wave pig. We were fat. That wasn't that wasn't our intention. Uh, we wanted to um, uh, we wanted to provide uh, our teachers with a little bit of uh, relief there. Um, and also, uh, I think a lot of that's come with the with the changes that's come with Reach to Achieve for those teachers to be able to use that portfolio as a teaching tool. Um, it, it really um, you know seems to. I would say it, it took a, we were in Greensboro Thursday and Friday, and that was a, a large part of the conversation Friday um, with, with uh, uh, folks there. What are you doing? Uh, I saw your letter. Cleveland County's letter was, was obviously gone several places, and, and the media yeah, saw our letter and really liked the things we suggested. Um, we've had some requests to send them some information uh, because they want to tell us. As it takes some attendant reference your letter, I don't know why they think it was Cleveland County. I think it was in a college. Okay, I hope so. questions. Um, if you've got questions over the next two weeks, feel free to call, call me or call Donna. We'll, we'll try to answer those questions. If you've got questions in reference to uh, reading 3D, and then we will um, bring you, uh, you've got a draft of that letter that we'd like to uh, bring to the March 10th meeting, um, and then we'll uh, present that at that time.
entire term of 2010. It would be four years. Thank you, Chairman Hammer. Chairman Hammer, board members, Dr. Bowles, distinguished guests, and my colleagues from the education profession behind me. I'm Chris Glover, chemistry and AP environmental science teacher at Burns High School and president of the Cleveland County Association of Educators. I'm here tonight along with Melinda Manning. She's a teacher at Turning Point Academy, and she is representing NCAA Board of Directors in Raleigh. I come before you this evening asking for you to approve a resolution calling for the General Assembly of North Carolina to repeal the legislation that involves the 25% educator contract. Belinda would first like to read the resolution in its entirety, and then I would like to speak to the resolution and its meaning to educators. Session Law 2013-36 SB 4402 Section 9.6 includes legislation that requires school boards to offer four-year contracts and bonuses to 25% of its teachers, the 25% contract, and whereas school districts are finding it difficult to select a method of determining who qualifies for four-year contracts, and whereas school boards value their ed teachers and believe them to be deserving of adequate and equitable compensation, and whereas teachers have received only a 1.12% state salary increase once out of the past five years, resulting in, the great, in a greater need by school districts to increase recruitment and retention of teachers, and whereas the Appropriations Act of 2013 cut funding for classroom teachers, teacher assistants, textbooks, instructional materials, and limited English proficiency, while continuing the elimination of funding for mentor pay and professional development. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Cleveland County Board of Education request that the General Assembly allow it to retain its prorated share of the $10 million allocated for the 25% contract to be used for alternative pay or compensation for additional duties such as mentoring or leadership roles. And now, therefore, be it resolved further that the Cleveland County Board of Education urges the North Carolina General Assembly to repeal the 25% contract and develop a more effective, long-term compensation plan for teachers tied to career paths with input from the education and business community. Adopted this 24th day of February 2014, should you choose. First of all, let me say, Ms. Wampler and Dr. Bowles, I sincerely want to thank each of you for what you've done by working with teachers to make the best of this legislation. While there is no best way to deal with this issue, you have listened and responded to our concerns, and we are grateful for your work with us. To the school board, 
I want to thank each of you for all the things you have done for us in our classrooms with the limited resources the legislature has given you. I never thought I would have to lobby for public education in a state that is founded on the belief in public education. North Carolina's Constitution clearly states that this state will maintain a uniform system of free public schools. Our leaders even decided we also needed a public university for our citizens, and UNC became the first public university in the United States. Our 16 campus system has been a model for other state university systems. So where are we now in North Carolina? The legislature continues to slash funding for teachers, teacher assistants, classroom supplies, and textbooks. According to a story on National Public Radio, North Carolina is the first state to decide not to pay new teachers to earn an advanced degree in the United States. Can you imagine telling your doctor not to go back to school and gain more knowledge? And would any of us actually tell our students that more education is not really what you need? No, not in the state of North Carolina. There is an attack on public education, the likes of which I've never seen in my 24 years as an educator. Across this great state of North Carolina, NCAA and school boards are coming together, standing as one voice and telling Raleigh, we have had enough. Newspapers such as the Charlotte Observer state the various teachers are torn up over giving up tenure for $500. The News and Observer, only in North Carolina could a possible pay raise become a nightmare for a teacher. The Washington Post school board defies North Carolina state law abolishing teacher tenure. And now I'm quoting from the Guilford County Schools Resolution of February the 11th, 2014, which most of us have heard about on state and national news. They stated in order to consider the contract offer, in order to consider the contract offer under the 25% mandate, teachers will not have sufficient information to make an informed decision when they are forced to decide whether to forfeit their vested property right to tenure, which was earned in good faith for dedicated service to the students of GCS in exchange for the four-year contract. A fundamental principle of contract law requires parties to know and to understand the bargain they are making, end quote. Our association, NCAA, filed suit against the state of North Carolina this past December to stop the removal of career status from teachers who have earned this property right. A property right that is not true tenure like the university system, but a guaranteed right to a hearing before this school board and or a hearing officer before being dismissed. <coughs> Administrators will still be offered this option. Why not teachers? So what are other problems with this legislation do we see? I've heard legislators and the news media say that the teachers who are chosen represent the top 25% or the best 25% of eligible teachers. Here's problem one. The word top or the word best is not in the legislation. I'll read the legislation. All superintendents shall review the performance and evaluation of all teachers who have been employed by the local board for at least three consecutive years. Based on these reviews, the superintendent shall identify and recommend to the local board 25% of those teachers employed by the local board for at least three consecutive years to be awarded four-year contracts beginning with the 2014-2015 school year. The superintendent shall not recommend to the local board any teacher for a four-year contract unless that teacher has shown effectiveness as demonstrated by proficiency on the teacher evaluation list. So now we must take the list and not call the list that we presented to you 
the top 25% or the best 25%, just the selected 25. Problem two, could we still say they are truly the best 25% of eligible teachers? Again, we need to understand the legislation. The word teachers is used generically in the legislation and it actually includes counselors, instructional resource teachers, and media specialists who are not evaluated on the teacher evaluation instrument, but on a different evaluation instrument. According to the Attorney General, the definition of teacher also includes social workers and others who are not teachers, but are paid on the teacher salary schedule. How can we compare teachers to each other, let alone with other employees from other specialty areas? I have what is known as an EVOS data effectiveness grade. My colleague Ann Goss, who's in the audience tonight, is a two-time Star Teacher Award recipient and whose students consistently receive superior ratings at the North Carolina State Bowl Contest. And she has no EBOS data for North Carolina final exam. The arts are just as important to students as the academic core. How do we compare teachers with test data to teachers without test data? Researchers have been asking this same question for decades. And our legislature wants us to solve the problem now. Problem three, the appropriation for this four-year contract has only been funded for one year. One might conclude that the intent of the legislature is to fund the contract for four years. Well, please let me inform you of the other intents of current and past legislatures. ABC bonuses for expected or high growth were supposed to give teachers and teacher assistants raises for each year a school shows growth. ABC legislation remained. Raises were withdrawn for lack of funding. Mentor pay. For each of your first two years of being a mentor, you will receive mentor pay. Mentor requirement stays. Pay removed due to lack of funding. Intent of the legislation was to have less testing. We now have more state testing than we've ever had. So when it comes to a contract, intent will simply not cut it. Is it funded for four years or not? A simple question. I've asked the question of two members of the legislature. I have the emails here. I have received no response. It's a simple yes or no for a very important component of the contract. The question could not get any easier. Is it funded for four years? Yes or no? If the appropriations have not been made, then how can this contract even be offered? I can imagine signing a mortgage contract with a bank. I can pay you the first year, and I intend to pay you for the rest of the contract. Problem four, the state evaluation system of teachers. Let's say if the final educator chosen is Educator 301. Is Educator 301 really much different from Educator 302 or 399 for that matter? This is a problem around the state because of this evaluation instrument and its subjectivity. For example, evaluation and ethics, element 1D, the evaluation instrument. Teachers demonstrate high ethical standards. An administrator or team of administrators gets to make this call. You are either ethical or you're not ethical. If we say teachers demonstrate high ethical standards, is there really a developing, proficient, accomplished, distinguished, area of ethics, who can possibly make that judgment call? And yet this evaluation instrument is calling on administrators to do that. You can't be a little ethical. <laughs> so how can we have four degrees of that ethical behavior? 
element to be he, teachers embrace diversity in the school community and the world. You either embrace diversity or you don't. There's no development, no proficient, no accomplished, no distinguished. You either are or you aren't. That's what teachers are having to deal with with this evaluation is. So after this list is published, based partly on this teacher evaluation instrument, how can we really tell educator 302 why they weren't chosen? So here at the end of our request for your approval, I'd like you to see a trend that we as teachers see with the legislature. A few years ago, they decided that we're not going to pay teachers and teacher assistants in August. Mortgages, college loans, car payments still had to be paid. The legislature decided to reverse the legislation. The legislature wanted to stop NCA from use deduction from payroll and single us out. I told one of our legislators, you can't single out one organization and not the others. He assured me they could. I have no law degree, but it seems that usually doesn't work well in our country when you can read legislation that's that easy. The courts stop that legislation. A voucher bill was quickly passed in the legislature this past session. The court has now placed an injunction on the legislation. Governor Rory on NPR stated, one feedback that I get from teachers is, will you respect us? Will you show us some respect, McCrory, says McCrory. They just feel like they're walked over, and no one likes to work for a company where they're just taken for granted. And a lot of teachers feel like they are taken for granted at this point in time. So governor and North Carolina legislature, we want our full-time teacher, we want our full-time teacher assistants back. We want our calendars back under our local control. We want textbooks, print or digital. Can you imagine telling a college professor you're not going to buy the textbook? because they cost too much. And if you're going to require us to test here in the last five days, is it really too much to ask that we get the scores back within two days? We have a little thing called valedictorian, salutatorian, and graduation. We need them. And lastly, repeal this 25% mandated contract legislation. As Dr. Martin Luther King said many years ago, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And I must say, these things you have heard this evening, which are all of us involved in the education of our future students, they matter to us. I thank you for your time. Board members, let us all stand united together tonight. I ask for your approval of this legislation.
key issue that, that the General Assembly has put before us is that they're valuing 25% of our teachers and not all of them. Uh, uh, maybe graphically that, that doesn't change the intent of those things, but uh, I believe it makes it more clear that we recognize and value all of our teachers, not just a selected 25%. Uh, I move the adoption of the amendment. Uh, I believe that has to be okay. It has to be a second. all the teachers and leave them all to be served in the All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Now on to the original motion, as I believe, made by Ms. Wallace and seconded by Ms. Miller. Oh. Um, I have a question. Um, and I don't know if you can not go any further without saying thank you um, for your kind words and it was very powerful. Um, I think it was a very brave thing to do and I think it's very brave that we as a board um, are taking a stand at a stance like this. Um, I'm reminded of the quote as you reminded me when you spoke, you know, we don't stand for something we fall for anything. So I'm very proud of this tonight. I'm going to stand for every teacher and every teacher's decision to get it right. But I don't feel like that we should have taken an hour away from our teacher's assistance that even at this point we should have made some way of working it out to left that hour with them and then stretched and got more if we could. Any comments on the resolution itself? Yes, sir. I strongly support the features of this. I think it's uh, something we need to, to stand for. The Gilbert County Division Just wanted to respond to uh, uh, much of the data, data uh, that uh, Mr. Glover shared, and I was curious. Uh, and, and, and if you could, could you know, maybe uh, qualify this statement, but there was a recent study uh, that talked about the percentage of teachers across the state who were above, who, who, whose performances was low and above proficiency, and it noted. Really, by one of the districts, the other is pretty much in line with everything that's you know, give or take. So, with that rationale, then I, I, it's difficult to understand the justification that uh, we, that the legislature proposed uh, a 25% uh, contract. But what happens to the other 50% that are all equally uh, qualified for you know, that kind of a I just wanted to state that because, again, that just out of line in terms of uh, how do we properly recognize the responsibility to do this job and limit the decision on 25%. That sounds like 21st century discrimination. But anyway, that's just not my problem. 
very popular once it comes out, and the results of that once it comes out. So I think it's a very bad law, as we all know, and we all agree. Uh, I appreciate your comments. I think it would be very good to go to Raleigh and let them all hear those comments that you that you said. And uh, I support them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mr. Lee, I believe you're going to talk to us about budget amendment and school bus occupancy. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Ford, we have in the packet the uh, second bus amendment for the year. This amendment is primarily for this one, but uh, uh, particularly in the, the local current expense fund and the state fund uh, is still primarily uh, positional for the end of the year, but there are some additional revenue resources uh, out there in that amendment right there. Primarily those additional revenues are uh, non-instructional supplies, uh, school technology, Gaming, gaming fund, digital learning, children's special needs, school resource officers and new grant, transportation, additional fuel adjustment, school connectivity. Those are the primary adjustments right there in the state public school fund. In the uh, federal grant fund, there's some additional revenue there. Those are uh, carryover budgets, uh, monies that were multi-year, that were not.
state uh, detailing the, uh, the process. We have a list of 14 proposed buses that we would uh, like to purchase. We have copies of the requisitions in there that are actually requests to uh, make a purchase that are not a purchase order yet. But, uh, pursuant to the Bureau policies, requiring board approval of any purchase order exceeding $100,000, we would respectfully request that the uh, these requisitions that we will uh, turn them into purchase orders. We will bring them back to you at some point in time. Uh, always in the years past, we've had the financing arrangement in place at the same time that we had the, the purchase orders. But the state does not have the, the financing done yet. And whenever that is complete, that is whenever the purchase order will be released from the state to the actual vendor. Process that's been in, in the past. We will have to come back to you for your final approval to accept that financing agreement whenever it is approved by the state. So we're only approving the base price then? You're approving the base price, and uh, ultimately, the, the state it, it will fund these, these units. Yes, that's correct. We're uh, approving the base price, but we'll approve some finance charge in those. <coughs> Chairman, board members, um, only have a couple of newly encumbered projects uh, since our last report. Uh, 
these are dealing with uh, security upgrades. We'll highlight just a few other projects. Uh, Kings Mountain High School, we did install a uh, stormwater drainage uh, really associated with the new field house. There at Kings Mountain High School, uh, we were able to get in. We did coordinate this with Mr. Hall, uh, contractor there for that project, to get in and put this uh, pipe underground to an existing uh, catch basin before they actually pour the sidewalls. Uh, we have completed the restroom partition replacement project that really involved four elementary schools. That's Brown, Grover, James Love, and West. Uh, Morgan Theatrical is scheduled to uh, replace the curtains at Barnes Auditorium the week of the 10th. Uh, just a couple other updates. Uh, Kings Mountain Fire Department has scheduled to burn the house on the property at West Elementary on March the 3rd. They plan to do that at school hours. Uh, Town of Grover is starting the culvert replacement the project there on Dogwood behind Grover. Uh, they've actually put in the uh, temporary drive to the access to our pre-K classroom. Issues with that. But I will share that uh, also, as part of that project, there's a sewer line and a water line that have to be relocated as they change out this culvert. I have spoken with uh, Town Grover as well as the contractor on site, and they do plan to work around our school schedule if they have to, to shut off the water. Uh, hopefully, this uh, culvert will be in this week. And I also want to make you uh, aware of uh, the pre bid schedule for the uh, softball dress facility. High school, we have scheduled that from March 11th to Tuesday at 2.30 here at the Staff Development Center. That will be the pre-bid for that project. The uh, bid open will be uh, two weeks later on March the 25th, again Tuesday at 2.30 here at Staff Development. And I plan to, I hope to be able to bring you that project to the uh, April 14th board meeting. Any specific questions that you have? Any questions? I don't have any questions about the projects here, but the sound system in this room seems like every meeting there's an issue. Can, uh, is it possible to have somebody come in that has some expertise to tell us what we can do to get the sound system in this auditorium right? Uh, Mr. Harris, we've got a plan in, in, in progress. Uh, we feel like it's initiated with this wireless mic here. The, the mics that you have are wired. This is wireless. And uh, I think we have to adjust this up. Uh, that it impacts them. And our plan is to come in and place a car fire here and then hopefully run the field. That's how you guys are working. Right. That's, 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 that's a plan to have, sir. Are you, you having a completion date on that plan? <laughs> 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 here you go, Eric. Are you part of it? Oh, that's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for hearing me. <laughs> I understand that. Thank you. Information. I think everybody's been waiting for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think some of our teachers just stated for this. I think maybe this may, may be as important to them as the 25%, and I, and I understand that. Uh, it seems to have been uh, very important as I've been to these schools and been out in the community and talked with the last few weeks. And uh, folks that work with us, that we work together on these weather calls, I don't make predictions about the weather, I make observations. So I'm not going to make any predictions tonight about the weather because now that sometimes kind of jinx, kind of jinx this to us. But I prepared, prepared for you um, just an overview of where we are in terms of inclement weather. And I included on there uh, both our late arrivals and our days missed due to inclement weather. Uh, this is always a complicated matter because we have to both look at um, student days look at the status of employees on those days when they are not working, whether they're taking annual leave, and are we exchanging an annual leave for an annual, annual leave, or, um, and so that sometimes directs the decision we make, uh, first and foremost is our concern for safety, but then sometimes we may say that a 10 month employee is not uh, allowed to work because we know they're going to have to exchange that for a day later on that would be an optional day. And so I won't go into that to later that point, but just to let you know that it is a complicated matter. So I want to go through uh, really what we have and where we are at this point and make a recommendation to you. We have been closed, as you can see, for uh, students, staff, and for students and staff in some fashion on the days of Wednesday, January 29, January 30th. Uh, we have been closed on February 12, 13, and 14. And you had designated in your uh, calendar so 
the makeup days as you typically will do, as you're required to do. And I have those uh, there for you. Those days were May 26, which is Memorial Day. You had January, January 21, which was at the semester break. And uh, incidentally, that is not an option for us because we passed that day before, as you can see, before we missed our first day of school. And so that leaves us with three additional days, spring break days, April 23, 24, and 25. Uh, back up to the top chart, you'll see what uh, would be the case if you do nothing. And that would be uh, really a couple of things. First, for the January 29 day, take May 26, and I'll jump down to February 12, 13, and 14, and because of the way those were taken, those would be the 23rd, 24th, 25th of April. If you do any, nothing, because that would be an annual leave or annual leave. And then beyond that, we still are short of that. March 28th was designated in the calendar, which we provided for you as a planning day at the end of the quarter, which is helpful to our teachers. But uh, that is a, is a day that we think now needs to become a student day. We need to exchange an optional planning for uh, the optional planning that we had on January 30th. So with all that said, that leaves you with some options that we uh, would present to you for your consideration. Uh, and I'll recommend one of them as the preferred option, I think, from executive staff. The first would be to extend the school year into June <coughs> into the 9th and 10th of June, which are now teacher planning days. Uh, that would be after graduation, so that would require seniors, unless you wanted to move graduation, that would require seniors to bank some days before graduation. Uh, that would seriously complicate testing earlier by Dr. Fisher or Mr. Glover or someone uh, mentioned about the testing calendar and now we have to test in the last final five days for uh, secondary school. And that would really complicate the matter of testing for our seniors, in particular the all students. Uh, that only accounts for two, two days leaving. Uh, uh, that would be Friday, April 25 as a school day. Well, obviously you all realize that it's not preferable to come to school one day the second option would be to exclusively use Saturdays for the three days. Uh, we know this would be a significant cost in overtime uh, because uh, Saturday uh, attendance would mean that all of our non-certified people would be on time and a half. And so even were we to make that a day when we tried every option that we had and reduced our staff still know that that would be a couple hundred thousand plus uh, to be able to do those three days. The third option, which some systems are going to forward, um, would be to add an hour per day. And because of the need to make up three days, that would require adding an hour a day. Uh, and it would take six days in that scenario to make up one day. And so in order to make up um, the time we missed, six uh, days and a part of another, require 21 days to make up the April 23rd, 24th, 25th. So that would essentially be about 20 days in a month. That would be essentially the month of March if we could do that. The fourth option would be a combination of Saturdays, additional hours, and or June 9th and 14th. Again, complicating after the end of graduation. And finally, uh, the fifth option, which we think is probably the preferred option, is to um, eliminate our early release for parent conferences on March the 13th and our early release on the last day of school, June the 6th, make those full days. We would still uh, plan to have parent conferences on those days, uh, on the March 13th day, but we would just not be able to begin, begin quite as early. The teachers were staying until 7 o'clock those days anyway, and so we would just not be able to have our parent conferences quite as early. Then go to school on Saturday, March 15th, from 8 to 2, and then use accumulated hours. We, you remember the legislation changed a couple years ago, uh, and then was solidified this last year that you have the option of 185 days or 1,025 hours. We exceed the 1,025 hours, and so we would 
suppose that we use some of those excess hours for that third day. The reason we're not proposing to use all three days and use accumulated hours for all three days is we believe that cuts us a little too close. We're not really, um, I got a lot of calls after the early, after the uh, January day to just wanted to know what we're going to do about the calendar. And I, I predicted that because uh, this is my last year making these calls that we would have our worst weather than we've had in a long time. Turned out to be right on this. Um, but I predicted we would miss some other days based on some of the forecasts that are out there. And, and we're not certain that we won't miss additional days. Some of our worst uh, snow has been in March, in my uh, 15 years of doing this. And so that would give us a little bit of a cushion uh, if we were to leave a few hours there in reserve. I don't think it will hurt. <coughs> Uh, work session. Yeah, work session. That would be 
some systems are doing that, and this is one of your Tuesdays are going to come on Saturday, that eliminates the overtime issue if it's not giving people the opportunity to take it to And that really causes you to have to make that employee not come to work. And I just think we're better off to give both time. And, and I think for the business fair, for our families, about it and I should have talked we should have checked this I know it's probably a calm day it's high school for us it's probably you know that's probably making tomorrow pouty day but pouty day but um, it is what it is. I mean I, we went down and found this egg that we thought was far enough out to be not uh, hopefully be safe. Hopefully we'll have any snow in May and that we thought would give us plenty of advance notice but would not be too close to the end of the year. A lot of thought
figure out how to do it in this tiny little box that they would do it with in the school county field that just limits us in so many ways. It's, it's, it's atrocious. And it forces us to do things like having school on Saturday and threaten spring break. That's not this board. That came out of the General Assembly down the hall. Anybody else want to do that? Any further? Any further? Any Yes, sir. I make a motion that we approve option five that was presented by the superintendent, which will make up school on May the 26th, May the, excuse me, March the 28th, Saturday, March the 15th, and eliminate urgent release on March 13th and June 6th, and also use accumulating hours in excess of 1,025 minutes for one day. And I further move that we designate Saturday, May the 10th, as a make up day that's
three minutes to your comments. There will be no response, but we will take them under advisement. If we have huge numbers, we can't accommodate to consider them, but we ask anybody who speaks, depending on the number, they cut their comments. Thank you. 